There's, a, there's an interesting part of that, of that pledge that we, that we make this kind of a pledge to be a part of something and to identify with something. Thank you. And uh, there was interesting wording to that that's very intentional. And that is uh, before this company, before the Lord and his angels. You know, there's a, there is something that's very real in, the, in God's creation, and that is the ministry and the role of angels. And there are times where angels are sent to do and to accomplish certain things according to the command of the Lord. And this is one of the reasons that we, that we have membership. There are, there are some congregations that don't have a formal membership, and uh, there was a season that we did not have a formal membership, and then we were kind of struck with the gravity of, as pastors, who am I responsible for? Uh, because during this non-membership, and it was a short season, but it was definitely a season for us, um, you know, because there's that thought, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a member of the body of Christ, and this is where I identify, and so... You know, because I identify, everyone else must understand that somehow. And, and we, would, we, we would have the Lord uh, steer us and guide us to help certain people that, because of their regular attendance, we assumed that they were members. And when we would talk to them, they'd say, well, I'm not, I'm not a member here. This is just where I like to come. This is where I like to get fed, like I'm just a pig that shows up at the trough every day. But I don't really belong to this herd. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I'm feeling a sense of responsibility, but they don't really have that, that same reciprocation. And so in regards to angels, there are times when, when the Lord will uh, make a decree for advancement or protection or provision toward that, to that congregation. And he'll send angels to, to, to minister to those who are members of that group or that body. And those angels, it's a confusing situation for them if you think you're a member because you attend, um, but you don't want to be a member and let everyone else know. And so, you know, you've heard the phrase, well, what's a girl supposed to do? Uh, just insert the word angel. What's an angel supposed to do? If the decree is to help uh, the members of that congregation in fuss and so, and there, there's not an identification. So membership is basically an identification where I say, I'm on that team. And we see that lived out, that illustration all throughout life, that... Uh, there are times when teams are called to play. And if someone who is not on that team uh, shows up in the locker room, everyone's going to say, well, wait a minute, you know, what's, what's your role, what's your place? Um, you show up for games, but you don't show up for practices. If you're a member of the team, we show up for the practices, we show up for the training. So really, ours as pastors, our, our ability to identify you as a member or not a member is just for the reason for us of responsibility. And then also for the angels in heaven that are sent to minister to certain groups and certain peoples. That in your pledge today, you became part of a people group. And uh, so when the Lord sends out a decree, uh, you get that. And there's no confusion, no earthly confusion, no heavenly confusion. So it's really an important thing. And uh, it's been very helpful to us. And we don't take it lightly. Amen? We don't take it lightly. It was really so wonderful how that all flowed today. You just really sense the presence of the Lord with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I'd like to challenge you a little bit. If you, uh, if you are strong in the word and you're seasoned a little bit and you've got some maturity in Christ, I think you will find this word uh, challenging to you. 
But also if you're young in the Lord or new in the Lord and you don't know a whole lot about the Bible or Christianity as we would call it, I think this would also be very instructional for you. I'd like to talk about what makes good fruit good and what makes evil or bad fruit evil. And, you know, Jesus said, um, beware of false prophets, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. You'll know them by their fruit. And they'll either have, their fruit will be good or their fruit will be evil. Depending on your translation, those two words are interchangeable. Bad fruit is evil fruit, evil fruit is bad fruit. But the comparison, the, the judgment, the discrimination that you are to make, how many of you know discrimination is not a bad word? We need to be discriminating. Matter of fact, I'm working on a little... Uh, teaching and I'll probably put on paper and, and publish about a call to intolerance and discrimination. Because as the church, we are supposed to be intolerant of certain things. Matter of fact, the judgment against the church of Thyatira in, in the book of Revelation, one of those seven churches, the judgment against them is that they were tolerating that Jezebel. They were called to be intolerant where they had been tolerant. There are certain things that we need to stop tolerating in our personal lives, in our personal behaviors, as well as situations around us. There, there is, I remember in our family, if, if you were assigned a chore, you were expected to do that uh, immediately, you're expected to do it with excellence, and you're expected to do it with a good attitude. And we would not tolerate a bad attitude. A bad attitude meant you still had that chore on your record and you were in your room until you adjusted your own attitude. And when you came out of your room, you still had that chore to do. All the way, all, all the way right away with a happy way. And so, so what we would, we, we did not tolerate a bad attitude. And there are certain things in our lives that we are to no longer tolerate. Uh, our attitude has a big role to play in whether or not the fruitfulness of our lives, our works, our deeds, our actions, all of those things that, that are, are to be good are either good or evil. I can, I can obey with a wrong attitude and my obedience according to scripture, actually be evil and not good. That word good's a powerful word. It's, 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 it doesn't just mean pleasant or acceptable or with excellence. I can bring forth a work of excellence and actually have it be evil in the eyes of the Lord. One of the scriptures that is really gripping about this is where Jesus says, and I, 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 I don't have the reference handy, perhaps you know it, where Jesus said, at the judgment, there will be people who will stand before him and say, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not heal the sick? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not perform mighty miracles in your name? And Jesus will turn to them and say, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity, one translation says. Another translation says, you workers of lawlessness. What that basically means is, you who did your own thing. If God calls me and speaks to my heart and says, lay hands on Terry, I want to heal him, and I sense my hands get hot with healing grace, and I can't find Terry, but instead I lay my hands on Rachel, what did I just do? I just did my own thing. 
I healed the sick, of course by God's grace. But I did my own thing. We can't get away from the fact healings, deliverance, miracles, prophecies, even ones that have an impact or accomplish what we prayed. See, it's not, he didn't say, well, did we not pray healing prayers in your name? No. Healing was a result. Did we not prophesy in your name? I mean, the, the, the challenge is coming from the prophesiers. Well, yeah, we prophesied. But when I put a word on your heart for that one, and instead you prophesied to all of them, Jesus isn't saying, I'm arguing with the accuracy of the word. He's not arguing with accuracy. He's not, he's not arguing with the impact of that word. He's not, he's not arguing with your intention to be a blessing. He's arguing with our obedience. If we don't do what he says in the way he prescribes it, it's evil. Even though it's a birthday cake. And mm, it's a carrot birthday cake. And I love carrot cake birthday cake. And we all enjoyed it. If that's not what he called for, it's not good. And there's only two choices. Good and evil. What he has called for and anything that is different than what he has called for is evil. Evil doesn't mean it's dark, foggy, gloomy, misty with long fangs and, you know, dirty fingernails and snarls and, you know, looks like a pirate. It could be something well-dressed, well-presented, done in excellence, but not what he called you to do. Not what he, better yet, calling means to, to call, to sound, to speak. It's not what he spoke to you. It's not according to his word to you or his will for you expressed in his words. It is not according to the truth the true thing he said to you, it can't be good. And if it wasn't called for by him and you did it, it means it was called for by me and you, not him. Does that make sense? So good is a very strong, limiting definition. Good, only God is good. Right, that's what Jesus said. You know, who are we calling good here? You know, you're just using this word flippantly. You call me good teacher. What do you mean good teacher? Only God is good. So Jesus is not saying I'm not good, but he's also challenging him, saying your use of that word good, you're basically saying I'm God. And I know you don't mean that because you're my adversary. So what, do you know what you even mean when you use the word good? Jesus is challenging the language. Only what God calls for by biblical definition, is good. Now, I don't expect us to all change the use of our English language here, you know, as we meander around the community or someone serves you a nice hot bowl of chili on a cold day and you go, oh, that's good. And then, and then you, you now need to go into your theological brain and go, well, I don't know if that's what God called her to make, so I don't know if it's really good or not, maybe. I'm not, not dealing with our common vernacular. I'm dealing with the biblical definition of what Jesus taught so that we can get this right. Matthew 7.20. That was the reference I was alluding to before. You'll know them by their fruits, their works, their deeds. And of course, what Jesus says, you know, many will appear before me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not? When we call him Lord, Lord, it means that he's the leader, he's the director, he's the speaker, 
And I am the hearer and the doer. If he's Lord, that infers that I'm not Lord. And I'm not obeying my own passions in a negative worldly sense. But neither am I giving an ascendancy to my assumptions, presumptions, opinions, my way of doing things. He's Lord. What he calls for must be done in the way in which he wants it done. As a matter of fact, as soon as you sense in your heart the Lord giving you a direction, and I think if we have, like what Jesus said, what's the most important thing? What did he constantly say? He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying. What is the Holy Spirit wanting to do? He's teaching us and he's guiding us. He's the counselor, the scripture says. He's counseling us. What is he counseling us about? How to do what he's leading us to do. So it's not just enough to do it. Lester Summerall, I don't know who Lester Summerall is, one of the, you know, God's generals of faith. Um, he talks about how the Lord uh, appeared to him. I, 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 th I think he was dying of tuberculosis. Isn't that right, Alan? Do you remember? Uh, he was on the deathbed as a, as a young man, dying of tuberculosis. And the Lord says, you can die of tuberculosis or you can preach my word to the nations. Uh, what do you choose, life or death? And he says, well, I'm going to choose to preach your word to the nations. <laughs> I ain't no fool. But he didn't like people. He was full of bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness. Of his own, of his own testimony, he says, but I hated people. And the Lord called me to preach to people. And I hated him. And the Lord had to work that out in his life. It wasn't enough to be obedient. He had to be willing and obedient. And that's the promise to Abraham that God made to him in covenant. If you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. The same as applies to us. We are Abrahamic, Abrahamic by, by creation, by the new birth. We're the... We're the seed of Abraham in Christ, correct? And so what God spoke to our fathers and our fa fathers in the faith, even Abraham, still echoes to us that God isn't just calling for obedience. He's calling for willingness, the right attitude, the right intention with our obedience. James 3, James chapter 3, verses 12 through 16 contains this phrase, selfish ambition. It says where there is bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, there exists every evil work. Here we've got that contrast between good and evil tied to the word work or deeds or fruit, if you will. Where there is selfish ambition, everything is evil. In other words... When I choose to make an action to the benefit of my own little kingdom and not firstly considering his greater kingdom, that's evil. It's selfish on my part. And Jesus said, you don't have to take care for anything tomorrow because I care for you. So when I choose to set my interests, my cares, my opinions above what the Lord would speak to my heart to do, that qualifies whatever I do from that place as an evil work. The evil work is not determined by the work that is performed. What determines if it's an evil work is by the intention and motivation of the heart that performs that work. And it's the same with prophets. Prophets. A false prophet can give a true prophetic word. But what makes that prophet false is not whether his words are accurate, but whether his heart is functioning from an independent false place. Does that make sense? 
So false prophecies, false prophets, evil works, those are things that all flow out of the heart of a man. And Jesus said, how can bitter and sweet both flow out? It can't. If my heart is acting independently, basing its actions and decisions, even though they're nice and kind, and I'm helping old ladies across the street, and giving birthday cakes to little children, filling out boxes to send to the nations, I want my box to go with an anointing and with power. So I'm going to pray about what I put into this. I'm going to be led by the Spirit as to what I write in that little letter. I don't want to just write, well, I hope you have a Merry Christmas, Jesus is Lord, and send it off because that's all I think I need to do. And I haven't counseled with the Lord. I would have just sent out an evil work. Even though it blesses the person receiving it, it's not counted to my account as a good work at the judgment. It's accounted as me doing my own thing, even though someone else was blessed by it. Does that make sense? This is why this is a message not just for the neophyte or the new believer. This is for us as seasoned believers. We constantly must be judging our hearts. What am I doing? Is it pleasing to the Lord? Why am I doing it? How am I doing it? I can't just go preach to the nations while I hate people. The Lord has to deal with my heart now, and I need to choose to love the people I used to hate. And it's within my power to do that. The mind and the heart of a human being is like a light switch. I have authority over that switch. I can choose to love or I can choose to hate. Just like I can choose to bless or curse, I can also choose to love or to hate. And if I'm struggling, I have a helper that indwells me as a believer called the Holy Spirit. He will help me love the people I know I need to switch the hate switch off and the love switch on that it isn't all dependent on me, but the choice, the decision, hangs in the balance for me. Does that make sense? And I can't say later, well, I tried to love him and I just couldn't get it done, Lord. And then you just enter into judgment rather than blessing. God is not going to hold us accountable for anything that is beyond our power to choose. He's just. He's righteous. He doesn't require of us things we cannot do. He requires of us sometimes the impossible, that I can't do it on my own, but even then, I have to choose to let him help me. Right? That's called humility. And then God adds grace that makes that effort successful because he gives grace to who? The humble. Those who lower themselves and say, I can't. You call me to do something impossible. I just can't do it. You've called me to forgive my abuser. I just, I just can't do it. Ah, not on your own. But if you seek him with all your heart, he will be found by you. And he will come if you humble yourself and ask for his help. And with him, he brings gifts and grace. Where now you can accomplish. We don't have any excuses. We don't have any excuses for not doing it, and we don't have any excuses for doing it with the wrong attitude or the wrong motivation. Jesus said to us, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Now, for me, that was a, that was a real puzzle for the longest time because the language doesn't line up. I thought of the kingdom as being this domain of the king, like you know, King Arthur, he had Camelot, right? So the kingdom was a thing. And then the second half of the verse says, uh, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Well, a kingdom's not a person. It's not a his righteousness. And so the, so, so the grammar was confusing to me being an educated person. And, 
And so I, I, I began to seek out, what, is, what does this mean? Seek first the kingdom. And I listened to some sermons and some teachings, and it was a popular notion that the word kingdom was a compound word, and it meant the king's domain. And if it means the king's domain, that means like Camelot, again. It's, it's a thing, and, and that thing people would say, is either the rule and the reign of the king. The kingdom is the sphere of his rule and his reign. And I'm thinking, boy, that doesn't clear it up for me a whole lot. And then I found, I found the, uh, the uh, scholarly etymology of that word kingdom. And the word kingdom is a compound word, but it's not a compound word of king and domain, it is a shortened compound word of the king and the word doom. I thought, oh boy, that's kind of scary. You know, because I think of, you know, doom as being, you know, gloom and doom and, you know, a bad attitude. And I'm like, well, why would I? That doesn't even make sense until I realized that we get also derived the word deem. Like, what do you deem necessary? That means what do you judge to be necessary? What do you deem this to be? And that the way we use the word doomsday and judgment day, those are the synonyms we're looking for. Judgment, doom, means according to the king's decrees or judgments. So the kingdom of God is every, everywhere that is under the judgments or the decrees of God. There are certain hearts that are opposed to that and they have not entered into the kingdom because they have not submitted to the decrees that Jesus is Lord over all. They say, well, he may be Lord over all according to heaven, but not according to me. He ain't Lord over me. I can accept the fact that Jesus lived and died and that he's the Savior of the world, sent from heaven, born as a baby, and I celebrate Christmas. But you know what? I'm my own Lord and Master. I make my own decisions, and God doesn't tell me what to do. So I'll go to church on Sunday because I'm blessed. I like the music and the kids' programs. But I'm going to act like a Christian on Sunday, and I'm going to act however the heck I want to act the rest of the week because I'm my own Master. Now that person thinks they're saved because Jesus they recognize as the Savior. But according to Romans 10, 9, and 10, if you confess Jesus as your Lord, you'll be saved. So we have to add to that, that did God raise him from the dead? Is he Savior? Yeah, of course he is. And do you decree him to be your Lord? Uh, no, I'm not going to go that far, the religious mind says. But our minds say yes. So he's Lord and Savior. Salvation takes place within that heart. If I seek first the kingdom, what does that mean? Everything else has second or last place, perhaps. If there's only two options, one is first and the other is last. If I'm seeking Jesus's judgment on this matter what does he say to me how does he want me to live my life where does he want me to work I want you to work in fast foods franchise I want to teach you some things McDonald's is hiring go get a job at McDonald's I hear the Lord say to my heart but being an American I think I'm gonna shop around anyways and so I call Burger King and I call Wendy's and both of them are willing to pay me 50 cents more an hour. Praise the Lord. I'm going with Wendy's because I like their food better than Burger King and they're paying me 50 cents more than McDonald's. And I go to work at Wendy's and I am completely smack dab out of the will of God because the Spirit of the Lord told me fast food, McDonald's, but I incurred my own genius and fell into my own trap of my stinking thinking and I'm working in the wrong place. And then I wonder why it's all going down the toilet. Or how about this one? Leave here or this thing folds, 
go over here and work here. Well, I just believe in increase. I'm a prosperity guy. I believe in advancement. And I was making $50,000 a year over here. And this place here, they're only going to pay me $30,000. And I know that place down the road, they'd pay me $60,000, twice of where. And all of a sudden, my own voice of my own genius, my own intellect, my own lawlessness, my own doing my thing drowns out the word of the Lord and I become deceived and I think I'm doing what I think in my heart I need to do but the only voice I'm hearing in my heart is the one I've given first place to and that happens to be me now. And I'm smack dab out of the will of God. And I'm wondering why all these other areas of my life are falling apart. We are to, according to Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom, the king's decrees and judgments concerning the matter, and his, now that his makes sense. I'm not talking about a domain kingdom. I'm talking about what Jesus is saying to my heart, speaking into my life. These are his personalized decrees and judgments for me that line up with the story Psalm 139 says. He wrote about my life before I was even born. Those are his decrees and judgments toward me. And now I need to have righteousness with him. Righteousness is always about alignment. Anytime you see the word righteous in the scripture, you could, you could circle it and write next to it alignment. I need to align myself with his decrees and his judgments. Or I'm aligning myself with my decrees and my judgments. And I am going to end up in a mud pit. Because I'm aligning myself with myself. What do I want? What do I like? What's convenient? None of that holds water on a stormy sea. And life is going to have its storms. And I have no promise of success unless I am seeking first the king's truth, the king's words, the king's decrees, the king's judgments, if you will, and right alignment with him and what he has said. This is what James talks about when he says, we can't just be hearers of the word, the kingdom, the king's judgments and decrees, his word, but we must also be doers of it. I have to align myself in agreement with it so as to cooperate with it and do it. You know, it's not convenient for me to pastor a church 20 minutes away from the town I live in. Why don't I resign this church and pastor one of the churches that's closer? It's more convenient. You know, gas prices are getting higher. And you know what? You're not always the nicest people. Maybe there are some other people that'd be a little bit nicer to me. I mean, this is the way we think, right? No, I can't, we can't do that. Because the Lord made a decree. He's made his will. He has spoken truth into our lives of what he wants for me. And it's here. Now I need to align my life with what he said. Gas prices are high. Maybe I just need to get by a commuter vehicle. Maybe I need to drive a motor scooter. <laughs> that was for my wife. I just like hearing her say, Phew. there ain't no more scooters. Bottom line, hear the word and do it is good fruit. That's a good work by definition. You doing what you heard the Lord say and doing it with the attitude that he has prescribed makes that a good work. That is how you know 
who is the Lord's and who is not. And when we all stand before the Lord, he's going to say, I know who's mine and who's not mine, those whom I know and those whom I don't know. We want to hear the word. Now, this will give you some insight as to the importance of a prophetic word. A prophetic word is always, and anyone who teaches on prophecy knows this, the, the, the primary and first application of a prophetic word is to confirm what God has been speaking to your heart. The problem is, we live in a culture where we are so distracted and so busy, we don't have ears to hear oftentimes what the Lord is speaking to our heart. And so sometimes a prophetic word, because I've become dull of hearing, a prophetic word has brand new information in it. And it's not necessarily intended to be in brand new information. It's tended to be an encouragement. Isn't that one of the reasons to prophesy? Edification, exhortation, and encouragement. Comfort, encouragement, exhortation. It's not necessarily meant to give me new information, but if I'm not listening, or if I'm listening, but I'm just constantly have the swirl. I, I like to tell prophetic people, one of the best things you can do when you want to hear God is turn the Christian radio off. Because you still have someone else pumping words and something you like and you prefer into our soul. And sometimes... It's hard to hear God through all the noise of someone else's theology or their song. I want to hear the song that God is singing over my life, not my favorite Christian band. Now, I don't have a problem with Christian music. I listen to Christian music all the time. But there are times when I need to sort out what voice am I hearing where I need to turn off every other voice. This is why seeking the Lord, David and the psalmists and the prophets, they all sought the Lord first thing in the morning. Oh Lord, in the morning, will I direct my prayer unto you and will look up. Oh Lord, in the morning. It's because your head's clear, these other voices, your concerns, your spouse, your kids. What are we having for breakfast? Hey, don't forget to take out the trash before and you got to go to the dump today and you know, it's, it's not bad stuff. It's just voices and clutter and noise. And oftentimes we don't hear the Lord, so the Lord in his kindness and his mercy gives us a gift called prophecy. Isn't that what it's called? A gift of the Holy Spirit. He's helping us. And then we get that prophetic word. Sometimes it's, it's a right-on-the-mark prophetic word, and because we have been listening, we're like, oh, praise the Lord. Sometimes the prophet thinks he's giving us new information. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. But more often than not, he's not. Because you've been listening. You have ears to hear. And that's a confirming word. And man, you're full of confidence after getting that word. There's other times we're so wrapped up in our own life, we're not hearing what God is saying to us. And that prophetic word has an anointing on it that breaks the yoke that has bound you to only hear your own voice. And that prophetic word can open your ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Does that make sense? But the bottom line is, we need to hear what Jesus is decreeing into our lives by the Spirit. And then righteousness, His righteousness, is his appropriate alignment for us with that word. I need to be aligned with the word of the Lord. Coming to your own conclusion, your own word or your own will about, the, what do you say about this situation? That's coming to your, to your own conclusion. What's, what's your word on the matter, we would say? Well, what is your will? What do you want us to do? What would you say about the situation? Coming to my own conclusion, and then to do that is evil or bad fruit. Even if the result is a good sounding and accurate prophecy, healing, deliverance. 
The point is, I don't get heavenly credit for it unless it's what God has called for and done in the manner that God has called for it to be done. I don't know about you, I want credit. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Whatever reward he's given out, I want it. If God has rewards for people, I want to be one of those that's getting the reward. I want to get my full reward because I don't want to partly honor God on Sundays and not honor him with my life during the week or in times of crisis. Usually that's where I blow it, times of crisis. Scramble around, got to do something. Really? Maybe the something I got to do is be still and know that he is God. Maybe the something I need to be doing is Wait, hold on, take a deep breath, relax. Yeah, but you know, I don't want to just be someone who just sits around. Oh, shut up. If God says sit around, be someone who sits around. Anything else is an evil work. Because you're doing beyond what he's called you to do. And you're functioning by your own genius and assumptions. Is this a hard word? Man, I'm just feeling the spanking. But it's good. It's necessary. Because the Lord wants us to have the full reward. I don't want to partly honor him. I want to fully honor him. Not just in what I do, but in the way I do it. When I was uh, uh, in restaurant work, I wanted to, I didn't just want to make a good impression, but when I was called for an interview, I wouldn't show up in my construction clothes. I wanted, I wanted this person to know that I want to honor the time he took to make time for me. So I'd put on a clean shirt. I'd wipe the sawdust off of my shoes. It's not always about getting further. Sometimes it's just about honoring someone else. Honor has a reward. God doles out the rewards. And he says, and the, to the same manner that you dole it out, it'll be doled back to you. Kind of a general principle of the kingdom. But concerning honor, he specifically says, if you want to receive the full reward of honor, then you need to be fully honorable. There are the, our Sometimes we've, we've got... We got really bad theology at times. We want to judge ourselves by our good intentions. Well, I meant to. I just ran out of time and I didn't. I wanted to do it the way God put it on my heart. But I got distracted and I hope this is okay. Well, grace, brother, I'm sure it's okay. God's kind, God's merciful. Yeah, God's not going to send you to hell over it but you don't qualify for the full reward. And God, above everything else, he is just. When he lays down the rules, there are rules to a race. Paul said this. Who gets the prize? The guy that completed the circles around the track or the guy that ran according to the rules? It's the one who ran according to the rules. If you violated someone else's lane, and but you still got the mileage in, you don't get the prize. Yet modern theology says, ah, but God understands. You just weren't paying attention. You ran in someone else's lane. Yeah, God understands. You're human. And he also understands 
you no longer qualify for the reward. It's we who have the problem understanding that God expresses his will and his way to us. And he commands us, choose the narrow way. It's the way that most people don't choose to live. How do most people choose to live? According to their own convenience, according to their own understanding, their own judgment. But even in the Old Testament, Proverbs says, don't lean on your own understanding. In other words, don't be a fool leaning to your own understanding. Well, that's not how I understand it. Oh, shut up. Who cares how you understand it? How you understand it doesn't matter. When the Lord makes his will clear and his way clear, that's the only way we can proceed and have it fall into the category of a good work. Anything else is arrogance. It's putting my opinion above God's way. Well, let's use the, let's use the other word. Pride. It's pride. And what does pride come before? The fall. And what is the actual uh, definition of that word that is translated fall? It actually means pride comes before destruction. Everything just starts to fall apart. And we think, well, I'm doing the Lord's work. I'm planting churches. Man, I'm, I'm taking responsibility. Is it what God's called for, for you? If it's not, don't do it. Well, I'm a church planter. Well, maybe you're not a church planter. Maybe you're a prophet. Maybe you're an apostle. Maybe you're not a church planter. You're a church establisher. But you don't even know what that means because you don't study the word, so you're just busy doing what you think you should be doing. Here again, pride, relying on our own assumptions, presumptions, and genius. And find ourselves smack dab out of the will of God. And then at the reward, the Bema seat, the judgment seat for rewards of Christ, God calls forth... Prophet Rachel Balsamo. Rachel doesn't know. Maybe that prophet was the deal for her. So she's looking around. Who's prophet? Boy, someone's got my same name. and They're a prophet. But she's functioned her whole life maybe as an evangelist. She's waiting for the reward to be given to Rachel the evangelist. But... There is no call for Rachel the Evangelist. The reward goes to Terry, man of God. Let's say no title. And he's been standing around thinking he's this fancy evangelist pastor guy. You know, there's... What we take upon ourselves... This is interesting, you know, the whole thing about, you know, the, the person Jezebel in, is it Revelation 2 or 3? 2.22? Is she calls herself a prophetess. God never called her a prophetess. She's walking in presumption and ending up being destructive. She probably gave a lot of good prophetic words. She sure had the respect and the admiration of many in the early church. But she was leading them into a ditch. And the fruit of her life was very different than what God had called for to a God, from a godly person. Depart from me, you who did your own thing, which means not according to the word and the will of the eternal lawgiver, but according to their own judgment. I am under the king's judgments. 3 John, verse 2 says, Above all things I would that you prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. If I seek continuously to surrender my soul, my inner life to the Lord, his judgment 
on that kind of living is prosperity and health. I want to fall under his judgments. So I'm going to align myself with the decrees he's made because his judgments toward me who believes are all good. Living in agreement with the judgments of the Lord is not a bad thing. Seeking first the king's judgment or his word or his will on the matter is the wisest thing I can do. Health has been declared as a judgment of the Lord over my sickness and disease. By his stripes, that judgment was declared. He told me to desire earnestly spiritual gifts. I see that in his word. I'm going to come underneath that judgment. And I'm going to align myself with him. And especially, don't just desire spiritual gifts, but desire especially that you might prophesy. I'm going to align myself with the king's word on the matter. And I'm going to seek after him with all my heart. I'm not looking or chasing after hoping to get a prophetic word. I'm chasing after being a blessing and giving prophetic words to others. That's coming into agreement with his, with his judgments. What he says about the matter, that's what I want. Bless those who persecute you and despise you. For when you do, great is your reward in heaven. Lord, I got, some, I got some tormentors in my life. And because they fall into that behavioral category of being tormentors, you told me to bless them. Lord, I'm going to come underneath in agreement with your judgments. And I'm not going to, you know, there's an interpretation of that. Uh, when you bless those who are mean to you, you actually put coals of fire on their head. Okay. How you, how you interpret that, that verse reveals your heart. They're your enemy. They're your opposers. They're your thorn in the flesh. And you're going to bless them by calling fire on the head to burn them up? Come on. Isn't that corrupt? What you do is you come alongside the Lord's judgment and says, Lord, I'm going to bless my enemies. Holy Spirit, help me do this with a right heart. This seems so beyond me. This has cost me a lot of sleepless nights. This has cost me a lot of turmoil. My goodness, I'm breaking out in a rash. You know, whatever, whatever your deal is that you're wrestling with this, our only option as disciples of Christ is to come under his judgments. When someone is identified as my enemies, I'm going to be kind to them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to be patient with them. Even though I don't want to, even though legally I may not have to, I'm going to because I'm not subjecting myself first to American kingdom judgments or my own kingdom judgments, my own little fiefdom, I'm going to come under the king's doom. How has he judged my situation? I have an enemy. I have people who have declared themselves my adversaries by their words or their actions. I'm going to bless and how am I going to do that? Am I just going to be obedient to bless? Or am I going to be willing and obedient to bless? Lord, help me, help me with my want to meter here. Because I really don't want to. I like to call, like to call fire down on them. I like to call. You, you've always told a great story. You know, that we went through some stuff and it was like, man, you know, uh, 
the prophet called, you know, mama bears out of the woods. And uh, maybe I should do that with my enemies. No, 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 don't do that. That'd be an evil work. It may be effective. You may actually call bears out of the woods and they'd eat those people. And you'd feel good about it because now you no longer have a problem. But it's an evil work. <laughs> See, the, the, what we measure as success is not success. It has to be success in the Lord's eyes. So Lord, help us. Help us hear you. And help us not just obey in a way that's convenient or good for me. But help me to obey in the way that is pleasing to you. Oh, Jonah. I know. I know. Jonah. What a knucklehead. Can you imagine being tasked with the, the, the onerous responsibility of prophesying destruction to the nation that when they, when they would find pregnant women in the nations that were adversarial to them, they, they, they would, the, the carnage, the, the cruelty was unbelievable what those Ninevites would do. They were one of the cruelest oppressors of, of other nations. And then, and then Jonah lets the cat out of the bag. He says, ah, I knew if I preached to them, that they'd repent and that you'd forgive them. That's why I didn't want to preach to them. Because I knew they'd repent and that you'd forgive them. And they're our sworn enemies. And they don't deserve to be forgiven. They deserve to have done to them what they've done to everybody else. And he had his own judgment. What he deemed to be the correct answer to the situation. And he wanted that rather than what God put in his heart. What an what a amazing story. Lord, help us to not be Jonas. Amen? Amen. Well, let's stand. We're going to be dismissed. There's so much that the Lord is wanting to do uh, with us, in us, and through us together along some of these lines where this is really imperative, that we, that we have this right, that we get this right. And we all can't get it right unless each of us is kind of leaning that same way, right? So we can't say, well, we are in this together if half of us are over, over here on the issue. And then we can't just look at these two groups that one is, we want the Lord's will and we want the Lord's way. And we can't say we are in this together unless we're really like-minded, all on the same page. That's the power of like-mindedness. It is so powerful. And God is calling us into a like-mindedness. He's teaching us in our personal lives so that we can flow together in our together life. So let's let the Lord challenge us personally. What are the issues of my life that the Lord is speaking to? What are the issues of my life that the Lord is speaking to? And Lord, where do I need to make an adjustment into either what I'm doing or how I'm doing it? What and how are the issues of the message today? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for Holy Spirit. He is alive and well. And Lord, we acknowledge him. Holy Spirit, we say you are no less God than the Father and the Son. And you have full authority to communicate to us the will of Jesus, our King. What he deems to be so, we align ourselves with that. What is his best for me? Not what do I think is my best for me. And Lord, we choose fresh again today the lordship of Christ in our lives. 
And if we say out of our mouths, and if this is you, just kind of just say it quietly. He'll hear you. I am not my own Lord. Jesus is my Lord. I am not my own leader. The Holy Spirit is my leader. And I have ears to hear what he would say to me. I have ears to hear. Ears to hear. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for ears to hear.